Hello, this is Dr. Viv. What we'll be doing in these uh, series of uh, 30 or so recordings is explore some more advanced aspects of classical mechanics. Now, classical mechanics can be defined as the mechanics of anything that's not uh, quantum mechanical or statistical physics in nature. So for example, the motion of a rigid body such as this yo-yo uh, would be a perfect candidate for classical mechanics. Uh, in fact, let's take our first problem to be that of a yo-yo. I have this yo-yo and I let it go down. So in slow motion, we'll go down until it comes to the end of the thread. And by the time it reaches the end of its journey, it's got a fair bit of uh, angular momentum as well as linear momentum stored up. And then when it comes to the end, uh, it continues to rotate in the same direction as it's rotating. So when it goes up, it climbs up the um, rope, but it's still rotating in the same direction. It's climbing up the rope on the other side. So it comes down on one side and it climbs up on the other side. Meanwhile, the uh, linear momentum has been completely reversed because it's now going up instead of going down. So let's take that to be our problem and we'll explore different aspects of it. Um, so first of all, let's try to model the moment of inertia of the yo-yo. See the shape is pretty complicated. It looks like it's got two disks connected by a very thin shaft. So we can actually ignore the mass of the shaft. If you see the shaft keeps getting smaller and smaller as the thread un unwinds. So right there you can see another complication of the yo-yo is that when the thread is completely wound, the radius is different than when the thread is completely played out. So we're not going to consider that complication. It just involves uh, more integration. And I don't think it's uh, significant. It can be done, but it's not uh, terribly interesting. And those who are interested in uh, solving that yo-yo problem uh, should definitely look at uh, one of the extra credits that you have in your homework assignments. So first let's try to model the yo-yo. I'm gonna model it as two disks. Separated by a small distance. Uh, the disks are identical in all respects. And there's a thin shaft. Uh, let us call the radius of the shaft little r and the radius of the disk capital R. So uh, as a uh, warm up, let's just try to determine the moment of inertia of this object. MOI stands for moment of inertia. Uh, you may have remembered some dim uh, formulas from your distance past about the moment of inertia of something that's disc shaped. Uh, but when you come to a graduate level, you, you don't remember things. You just derive them each and every time. So let's derive it. Uh, First of all, we realize that the effort it takes to rotate the yo-yo about this axis does not depend on this direction. It only depends on how the mass is distributed from the axis of rotation like that. So it doesn't depend on this direction at all. So we can as well look at the yo-yo from, uh, from the front like that. Now, a typical mass point of the yo-yo in the coordinate system that we should use for this uh, known as a polar coordinate system. So a typical mass point, which we'll call dm, is located at a distance r, the yo-yo's total radius is capital R, like we saw there. This little r is different than the um, inner radius of the um, radius of the spindle. We're just calling this distance the calculus variable r. So don't confuse them. 
uh, and this length thickness is dr. Uh, and then by the rules of calculus, um, this distance is going to be r d theta because that's equal to ds, the arc distance. So we have the dimensions of the object, um, the element. The element has got thickness dr and it's got arc length r d theta. So the area of that element is known to us. So we can write the area element, which I'll call dA as r d theta dr. Now, uh, we also have the concept of density. Now, the uh, proper density to think of in this case is because I'm thinking of a flat disk here. Like I said, it doesn't matter how deep it gets uh, because the disk can be considered a flat disk. So I'm gonna think of the mass density as sigma. Pen has run out of ink here. I'll call it sigma naught to signify that it is a constant. So this mass density will be kg per square meter or mass per unit area. So we have our um, way to get to the mass is to multiply by density and the area. So the mass dm is going to be uh, the mass density sigma naught times dA. And so that's going to be sigma naught times r d theta dr. Now the formula for the moment of inertia of a rigid body is i equals the integral of r squared dm. That's the standard formula. So that's going to be the double integral uh, r squared sigma naught r d theta dr. A double integral because there are two variables r and theta. Well, clearly the angle theta goes from zero to two pi. So we can separate that out. I can take sigma outside zero to two pi d theta. And then the r variable is gonna be the integral from zero to capital R, r cubed dr. The integral from zero to two pi of d theta is just two pi. So I get two pi sigma naught and r to the cubed dr when integrated gives me r to the four over four. which is the answer. If you wanna write it in terms of the mass, you may have to do one more step, which is to find the mass. Well, the mass is just the integral of dm. So when you do the another double integral, I'm gonna get sigma naught, the double integral from of r d theta dr. And then just as we did the integrals there, we can split it up into a theta integral and the r integral So I'm gonna get two pi sigma naught times r squared over two, which is exactly what you would expect. This is just uh, the mass density times the area of a circle or the area of a disc rather. So that's exactly what you'd expect. Now what we can do is we can write the moment of inertia in terms of the mass. So how we do that is to take what we need to create a mass here. So I need sigma naught and pi r squared to make a mass. And that leaves me with whatever else that's there. Uh, this two and this four cancels out. So I get one half r squared. So that's one half m r squared. If you remember this result, well, congratulations. You remembered right, but again, uh, this sort of result should be able, something that should derive in a matter of seconds uh, at the graduate school level. So um, as a warm-up also, continuing the warm-up, let's say the ratio, uh, looking at my yo-yo, I examined that the ratio R upon R is some definite quantity 
So I'm going to say R upon R, the ratio of um, big R to little r to big R. Let's say is known. Actually, let's say the ratio of big R to little r is known. And let's call that ratio zeta. And according to my yo-yo, it is uh, six. So I want to express the moment of inertia in terms of uh, this quantity, zeta and little r. We will soon see why we do that because the capital R is sort of a dummy radius for the yo-yo. All the interesting action is happening around little r. So we would like a formula of the yo-yo's moment of inertia involving little r rather than capital R. That's why I'm going through this uh, multiplying factor. So let's write the moment of inertia in terms of um, this ratio. Okay, so I'm gonna write I equals one half M little r squared. And to compensate, what I'll have to do is do that. Okay, in this manner, I've written the moment of inertia in terms of little r. But because I have capital R squared over little r squared, I'm gonna get zeta squared. So that gives me zeta squared over two times mr squared. Now let's put zeta equals six. So for our yo-yo, the moment of inertia about center of mass um, with R being involved is I equals, that's a zeta squared, so that's a six squared or 36, 18 MR squared. So that finishes our little warm up. We have successfully found the moment of inertia of our yo yo, where M is the mass of the yo yo. If you want, you can weigh it and you can find the radius using a pair of calipers. These are things I'm just not interested in doing. Uh, but uh, let's just list the assumption we have made in deriving this formula, and that is the uh, spindle uh, connecting the two uh, disks is massless. So um, the um, question is, what can we do with this yo-yo? We have this wonderful system. Uh, we have worked out the moment of inertia of it. So it might be good to play with it for a little bit. Uh, the usual, the simplest play of a yo-yo is to just let it go down and make it come back up. So uh, first of all, let's imagine that someone is holding it. A child is holding it. The child doesn't know how to play. It just goes all the way down comes back up, but it doesn't come back all the way for obvious reasons, the friction, air resistance, and so on. Uh, so the first problem we're gonna solve is if nothing is done to a yo-yo, it simply goes down and comes back to a smaller height, okay? And what kind of angular impulse and what kind of linear impulse does the child feel when the yo-yo bottoms out? All right, that's the uh, basic exercise we're gonna try doing. Now, in all these exercises, uh, every exercise that we come up with in yo-yo dynamics is more complicated than the analysis that we're gonna show uh, because yo-yo is a very complicated object. Uh, but in the interest of solving a problem and doing it in reasonable time, let's uh, always simplify our assumptions. So here's a problem statement. If uh, nothing is done, to a yo-yo upon unwinding down um, some string length capital L, which we'll say is much bigger than the spindle radius R, uh, it comes back up to a height 
eta times L, where eta is less than one. Find one, the linear impulse, and two, the angular impulse. Um, delivered by the hand. When the yo-yo bottoms out. All right, so um, as a um, small introduction, uh, what is the linear impulse and what is the angular impulse? Now that comes from Newton's second law. Uh, Newton's second law, which I'll abbreviate here as uh, N to L. Newton's second law for uh, forces is external force equals the rate of change of linear momentum. Well, this can be written as the integral of f x dt equals the integral of dp. And if you integrate it between the initial and final, uh, this gives us the linear impulse, j, I'll call it j linear. Um, j linear, which is a vector, is equal to the change in linear momentum. Capital de delta means change. So that means it's P final minus P initial. This is called as the linear impulse momentum theorem. Well, Newton's second law for rotation is the sum of all the torques, which I'm going to write just as tau. So that also I should write the sum of all the forces, but I'm just writing it as F. Uh, this is going to be equal to dL by dt, where L is the angular momentum of the system. Um, this I can again integrate both sides by, after multiplying both sides by dt, or to be more precise, taking the differentials. Uh, so that's going to be the integral dl i to f. And then when you integrate this, I get uh, j angular, j ang equals delta l. And that's lf minus li. That's called as angular uh, impulse momentum theorem. Normally, you probably would have studied the linear impulse momentum theorem in great detail in your undergraduate classes, uh, but typically your instructor uh, may not have at the time to do the angular version. I know I don't, so uh, I am pretty sure no other instructor does it either. Uh, so uh, we're going to be using both of these because I'm asking you for both the linear and the angular impulse when the, your, your bottoms out. So uh, clearly to find the linear impulse, I would have to find the change in the momentum, which means final uh, minus initial. So I have to find the final momentum, I have to find the initial momentum, which means I have to find the speed at the bottom. And once I have the speed at the bottom, I can use the relationship between linear and angular variables to find the angular momentum also. So both the problems can be solved rather easily. Um, so let me just, uh, take some time to clearly draft um, a figure of what happens on the way down and on the way up. So this is the hand. So that's also my hand. So on the way down, the and here I'm going to imagine I have a transparent yo-yo. Uh, actually, actually, I do have a transparent yo-yo at home which I should have brought. So on the way down, the yo-yo is doing that. Um, on the way up, it's winding the other way. 
Okay. Now, when it comes all the way down, let's draw a not draw what happens when it turns around. When things turn around, the yo-yo is going from um, becoming tangent to becoming perpendicular to becoming tangent again, but on the other side. So I'll draw the other side. So it becomes tangent again on the other side. Right now it's normal here and now it's tangent over there. So um, that's the state of affairs of this yo-yo. It's coming down with some speed, we'll call V, um, the angular velocity. It's gonna be like this, even though I draw it like this, it's actually into the page because you can see that by the right hand rule, it's into the page. Now, when it comes up, it's gonna still be rotating the same direction. So it's still into the page. However, the velocity will be um, on the way up, it's gonna be reverse. So there's a big difference between the linear impulse and the angular impulse. The linear impulse, the velocity is gonna be slower. And that's why I drew the arrow a little bit smaller because uh, on the way down, it's gonna be moving faster than on the way up because it does not quite make it all the way back to the top. It goes only up to eta. Uh, if eta equals uh, equal to one, then it goes all the way up to the top but eta is less than one. So it comes somewhere here and stops. So now we have to figure out uh, what the velocity is just before the collision. The collision event is when the string straightens out, you have this collision, okay? And it's the moment of collision where the person feels anything uh, unusual. Of course, they're feeling the tension all the time, but uh, because the tension is happening at a continuous way, the person does not um, feel anything strange, but at the bottom, there's the sudden snap because it has to snap back up. Uh, the linear momentum has to reverse direction, but the angular momentum keeps its direction. So first of all, since R is much less than L, R being the radius of the spindle, we're not gonna worry about this extra distance that the yo-yo is gonna descend from the point of tangency to the point of normalcy. So we'll straight away dismiss that extra distance that it will descend. And uh, we'll write down an equation. The equation to be used is energy. So I'll write a justification R much less than L. So neglect um, loss of potential energy. Falling down uh, from string tangency. Um, to string normalcy. Okay. Then the change in potential energy is gonna be MGL, that's the potential energy lost, and it's gonna be equal to the kinetic energy gained uh, plus the rotational kinetic energy gained which is one half I omega squared. So these are standard formulas from your uh, childhood physics class. Uh, we also have to use the fact that omega is related to V as follows. Always use the radius around which the string is being wrapped. So that's the little R you have to use there. It's called a no slip condition. Uh, also we have I equals uh, this quantity, which I have, uh, I'm gonna call this the moment of inertia to be zeta uh, mr squared, where zeta is gonna be 18, okay? So this is gonna be my new notation for the moment of inertia. Okay, uh, I'll just remind you that zeta equals 18. So um, that way we can cancel out the no slip condition very nicely. So I'm gonna get MGL equals one half mv squared plus one half zeta mr squared times omega squared, which is v squared upon r squared. These r squareds cancel out. That's always a symptom of no slip. That kind of cancellation always happens. So I get mgl equals one half times one plus these capital M and little m's are the same thing. So, I didn't mean to write capital M there, but you should understand that. Zeta times little m v squared. Now I lose my 
yo-yo mass m. So uh, at this point, uh, what I can do is uh, move it over to this side so you can still see. Uh, if you're trying to make notes, you can still see what I did there. So continuing with our work, I can now solve for the uh, speed. The speed, which I'm gonna call V down. Actually it's V down squared because I get V squared. Uh, V down squared is uh, two GL over one plus zeta. And I also know that on the way up, it only goes to eta L. So I can immediately also conclude the V up squared, which is the speed just after collision. So before collision, it's V down, after collision, it's V up. Let me just indicate that over here, these little collision events. With V up slightly smaller than V down. Uh, so V up squared, the only difference would be that we have to multiply the numerator with eta. So we have our um, basic results and we can find the linear impulse. J um, linear, that's gonna be the change in the angular momentum. Well, uh, that's mass times the uh, final velocity, which is uh, V up in the direction I had, uh, minus the initial momentum, which is V down in the direction minus I had, because it's going down. So you see the minus of a minus makes it plus. So this gives me M times uh, V up plus V down times I had. Now all I have to do is take the square root and so on and put it there. So I get my answer. Uh, when I take the square root, all this will be common except for the square root of eta. So I'm gonna isolate that term separately. So I get two GL over one plus zeta um, times one plus square root of eta. So um, times I had, so this gives us the linear moment uh, impulse with the direction. And that makes sense because the person exerting the impulse knows that he has to, or she has to yank it up or the yo-yo won't come back. Now for the angular impulse, all we have to do is use the angular impulse momentum theorem, J ang is LF minus LI. So let's do that. Um, delta L, which is I times omega uh, F minus I times omega I. Now in this case, uh, this is interesting because both the omegas are negative or into the page. So let's call into the page negative. Um, so if both the omegas are negative, this is just going to be um, negative I omega F, uh, that's minus of a minus or plus I omega I. And now I'll, I'll have to do is use a no slip condition, which is uh, V equals omega, um, omega equals V over R. So I is common, so I'll take the I outside, I times omega I minus omega F. Now I is uh, uh, this zeta business MR squared. And this one is gonna be V, uh, omega I is gonna be V down, magnitude V down over R minus V up over R. Uh, v down and V up differ by a factor eta, root eta because that's V down squared and V up, V down and V up will be square root of that, so that's root data. Um, there's an R factor which goes away. 
So I have zeta, keep mixing up little lambs and capital lambs. It's the same thing. Little lambs are the same as capital lambs. So I write little m now. Uh, zeta mr times the square root of uh, 2gl over one plus zeta times one minus root eta. And because this is always guaranteed to be positive, since eta is less than one, root eta is also gonna be less than one. Uh, so one minus root eta is gonna be bigger than zero. So this is gonna be out of the page. If it's out of the page, it means that your hand will tend to rotate in the counterclockwise direction, which makes sense because when the yo-yo goes down, your hand will go in a counterclockwise direction, which means you'll, your hand will dip down like that. Okay, the dipping down is a reaction impulse that the yo-yo exerts on your hand. So your hand creates this semaphore signal type behavior. It goes like this to this. <clears throat> now, if you don't want this behavior, if the child is experienced now and wants the yo-yo to come back up, so um, find J linear, this part B, and J angular, uh, for you, you to come back to hand or return to hand. Well, if you're an experienced yo-yo player, that's what you want to do. You want a yo-yo to come back. So um, clearly, what uh, eta will be set equal to one in the above expressions. So uh, let us just finish up that uh, little final part of the problem. So uh, J linear is then gonna be, let's be square root of one. So it's gonna be two times M root two GL over one plus zeta. I think this is psi, <laughs> but I'm calling it zeta. I hat and then J angular, it's gonna be zero. The angular impulse is actually gonna be zero. And everybody knows who has played the yo-yo that uh, on average, if the yo-yo comes back to you, then your hand doesn't dip. You, you keep, uh, on average, the hand doesn't dip, okay? And that's the symptom of saying that the angular impulse exerted, the back angular impulse exerted by a yo-yo back on the hand uh, stays zero on average. By the way, there's an important uh, cautionary remark. Uh, and um, so let me just write that here, caution. A uh, popular misconception uh, at this level of uh, physics is to think the angular impulse, J ang, is equal to R cross J, J len. In this case, that is not the case. You can clearly see it's not the case because um, for the case in which the yo-yo comes back to your hand, angular impulse is actually zero. Uh, whereas the linear impulse is uh, something that's not zero. So this uh, is simply not the case. And to understand why this is not the case, uh, let's try to understand why it is. If J ang must be equal to R cross J len, it would mean that Delta L would be equal to R cross Delta P. And this is where we see there's a problem because Delta P uh, is gonna be R cross PF minus PI. But that is not the case. Delta L separately, if you were doing this legitimately, it would be R cross P, the whole thing F minus R cross P, the whole thing I. So this is where you can see uh, the problem occurs. If you do R cross PF minus PI, the R vector is the same both on the way down and on the way up. Well, that's clearly not the case. The R vector on the way down is this. Let's call it R down. And R vector on the way up, okay, is gonna be the, uh, the R vector goes from the center to the, uh, from the center to the uh, point of tangency. So R vector on the, on the way up is like this. 
So you can see the R vectors switch directions. Because the R vectors switch directions, you cannot do this. Uh, R cross PF minus PI cannot be done. You have to do R cross PF minus R cross PI. And that is why this uh, is not true, okay? So that's the end of my first video. I hope this video has taught you a lot about uh, the impulse momentum theorem, both for the linear case and the angular case. Uh, all the best, and I'll see you in the more uh, further videos where we'll get into some other review type things.